When did it happen? How did it happen? Uh, it happened uh, a few weeks ago. <laughs> we were introduced actually by a mutual friend who um, we will... We should protect our privacy protect and not our privacy, reveal yeah. too much of that. And, um, I didn't know much about him, and so the only thing that I had asked her when she said she wanted to set us up was, I had one question, I said, well, is he nice? To really get to know each other without other people, you know, looking mm -hmm. or trying to take photos on their phones and all that kind of stuff, you know, with that, that comes, that comes, comes with the, comes with the job, comes with the role, but um, well, where so possible. In this video, I'll do a conversation analysis of Harry and Meghan's engagement interview. I did a video about this interview a while back. However, that video was a comparison to Harry and Meghan's interview with Oprah. This video is focused on the engagement interview, and it brings up new points that I hope you'll find exciting. I'll focus on turn-taking and the power dynamics that turn-taking causes. What do you notice in the interview we're about to see? Let me know in the comments below. Thanks for being here. I hope you enjoy. I'm a linguist trained in linguistic methods designed to decode statements and conversations. I analyze the language of criminals and media personalities. If you find this kind of content exciting, please subscribe to the channel. Turn-taking refers to the process where participants speak one at a time in alternating turns. Turn-taking is put in place in order to minimize gaps, uncomfortable pauses, and minimize overlaps or interruptions. The end of a speaker's turn is called a transition relevant place. It's the point where it's appropriate and many times necessary that the other speaker begins his or her turn. As participants in a conversation, we decode that it's our turn to speak by assessing the other speaker's syntax, intonation, and or gaze. Once a transition relevance play has been reached, there are three basic rules for who gets the next turn. Rule 1a. The current speaker selects the next speaker. The selected speaker then has the right and obligation to speak. No other speaker has that right or obligation. Rule 1b. A non-speaker self-selects and thus acquires the right to speak. Rule 1c. The current speaker may continue to speak until the next transition relevance plays. Let's keep these rules in mind as we watch and listen to the interview. Congratulations to you both. Thank you. Can we start with the proposal and the actual moment of your engagement? When did it happen? How did it happen? Uh, it happened uh, a few weeks ago. As we see, the interviewer looks at both Harry and Meghan. She doesn't select just one of them. Instead, Meghan selects Harry. Her gaze and arm gesture make this selection clear. Harry is now given the right and also obligation to speak. The interjection a uh, is called a hesitation marker, and the vowel lengthening delays it even further. It has two functions. One, to show the other participants, in this case Meghan and the interviewer, that the speaker, Harry, knows that it's his turn to speak. And two, to buy more time to contemplate the answer. Um, earlier this month here at, at our cottage, um, it's a standard, typical night it's for us. It's a cosy night. The recurring hesitation markers and micro pauses reveal that Harry's having trouble answering. Thus, his selection of Meghan is unsurprising. His selection is comprised of three factors. Gaze, grammatical completion, and slightly rising intonation, as if he's asking her. What, was, what were we doing? Just roasting chicken roasting and having... Chicken. <laughs> trying to roast chicken. Trying to roast a chicken. And it just... To... As we observe during these seven seconds, Megan's looking for a way to initiate a longer turn. She selects Harry to speak when she asks him what they were doing. She parrots his word choice, trying to roast a chicken. Parroting and gazing have two primary functions, to show alignment and to get the other speaker to cooperate and or agree. Megan's then comfortable enough to complete her turn, grammatically as well as phonetically. Uh, just an amazing surprise. It was so sweet and, and natural and very romantic. He got on one knee. <laughs> Next, the interviewer selects Megan to speak. And after Megan's answer, we observe the same pattern. Via her gaze, she selects Harry to speak, and thus seeks his agreement and cooperation. 
Of course. Was it an instant yes from you? Yes. As a matter of fact, I could barely let you finish proposing. I was like, can I say yes now? She didn't even let me finish. I said, can I say yes? I can I say yes now? And then, then there was hugs and I had the ring in my finger. And I was like, can I, can I give you the ring? And she goes, oh, yes, the ring. <laughs> so no, it was, um, it was a really nice moment. It was just the two of us. And um, I think I managed to catch, catch her by surprise as well. So. Yeah. In the following, the interviewers asking questions that apply to both Harry and Meghan. We again observe that Meghan's comfortable taking the turn when these broader questions are asked. This is how long after you first met? Oh, it would be a, a year and a half, to yeah. a little bit more than that. No, just about, about, about a year and a half, that. yeah. Which for most people would be quite a whirlwind. Is that how it's felt to you? I don't think that I would call it a whirlwind uh, in terms of our relationship. Obviously, there have been layers attached to how public it has become um, after we had a good five, six months almost mm. with just privacy, which was amazing. Um, but no, I think we were able to really have so much time just to connect and we never went longer than two weeks without seeing each other even though we were obviously doing a long distance relationship. So it's, um, we made it work. Let's listen to the second question again. Which for most people would be quite a whirlwind. Is that how it's felt to you? I don't... This is a visibly harder question for them to answer probably because the whirlwind metaphor has negative connotations, that maybe they've acted too spontaneously or something similar. Harry makes a smacking sound, I indicating that he's about to answer. However, Megan immediately takes the turn to speak. In this longer turn, she seeks Harry's agreement that it's not a whirlwind and that they had much time to connect. How did you first meet? Uh, yes, we During these three seconds, the interviewer selects Harry via gaze. Therefore, he's obliged to speak. However, Megan interjects as she focuses her gaze on Harry. Uh, mm. yes, we this interjection has two functions. One, it's a presupposition that Megan knows there is a story to tell, and as we learn in a short moment, that the story is potentially dangerous. Two, it's a hint to Harry that she also has something to say about the first meeting. Let's observe what happens next. First met, we were introduced actually by a mutual friend who um, we will... We should protect her privacy protect and not her privacy, reveal yeah. too much of that. And um, Harry says... Who um, we will... The hesitation marker indicates that he's looking for a way to finish the sentence. The subject that the interviewer brought up is obviously sensitive to Megan since she doesn't wait for Harry to finish his sentence. She says, We should protect her privacy. While looking at the interviewer. But then she focuses her gaze on Harry as she says, Not her privacy, yeah. too much of that. And this last part of her utterance becomes a reminder to Harry, a reminder that he should be careful in answering this question. Megan's initial interjection and uh, now this reminder yes, suggests that Megan would have liked to have been asked this question. Instead, it's now up to Harry to talk about their first meeting, but clearly in a restrained fashion. But it was, it was literally, it was through her, and then we met once and then twice, back to back, two dates in London mm. um, last July, Yes. beginning of July. And then it was, I think, about three, maybe four weeks later that I managed to <laughs> persuade her to come and join me in Botswana, and we... And we, we, we camped out with each other under the stars. And we spent coming join me for five days out there, which was absolutely fantastic. So then we were really by ourselves, mm -hmm. um, which, I th which was crucial to me to make sure that we had a, a chance to, to get to know each other. Yeah. In linguistics, we work with the notion of sensitivity. Sensitivity entails that certain points are highly important, sensitive to the speaker to get across. One way of determining sensitivity is to look at the question answer relation. Is the answer proportionate to the question, or does the answer contain much more information than the question called for? Let's have a listen to the following question and answer. The interviewer asks Megan a simple yes-no question if the friend tried to set them up. But the friend who introduced you, was she trying to set you up? Yes, it was definitely yes. a setup. <laughs> it was a blind it was date. A blind date and, for sure. and it's so interesting because we talk about it now, and even then, I, you know, because I'm from the States, you don't grow up with the same understanding of, of the royal family. And mm. so 
while I now understand very clearly there's a, a global interest there, I didn't know much about him. And so the only thing that I had asked her when she said she wanted to set us up was, I had one question. I said, well, is he nice? Because if he wasn't kind, it just didn't, it didn't seem like it would make sense. And so... Megan's direct answer is completed after she says that it was a blind date. But the friend who introduced you, was she trying to set you up? Yes, it was definitely yes. a setup. It was a blind it date. Wasn't. Yet she continues for an additional 35 seconds with a different kind of information. This information starts with a vowel lengthening of the initial letter in the conjunction and, and before she repeats the conjunction, but now without vowel lengthening. And it's so interesting because we talk about it. The first prolonged and is a way of keeping the turn. And in and of itself, the conjunction and is paratactic meaning that the speaker is about to place another sentence next to the previous one, and thus has more to say. And now, and even then, I, you know... Megan self-repairs and indicated that she's still looking for a proper way to initiate the new information. Self-repairs often occur when a speaker is looking for a way to say something while still keeping the term. The term you know is filler in this context, also serving to keep her term. She says, Because I'm from the States, you don't grow up with the same understanding of, of the royal family. And mm. so. This formulation is hypotactic because of the dependency between the two clauses. There's a strong dependency here. She makes a causal relation between being from the States and not growing up with the same understanding of the royal family. The grammatical subject in the dependent clause is the pronoun I making this personal for Megan. But she then shifts to the pronoun you, generalizing her personal experience. So she tries to associate with Americans in general. This way, she's not alone in feeling like this. Linguistically, that is. The clause, while I now understand very clearly, is inserted during her explanation, thus pointing to the fact that it's sensitive to her to emphasize that she now has a very clear understanding that there's a difference between now and then. Syntactically and phonetically, I didn't know much about him, is a sign focus. This is the most important part of her additional information. She then goes on to say what she allegedly asked her friend before she returns to what happened on the date. I had one question. I said, well, is he nice? And so we went and um, had a, met for a drink. And then I think very quickly into that, we said, well, what are we doing tomorrow? We should, no. we should meet. She could have just said it was a blind date, that they met for a drink, and that they planned to meet again the next day. But she doesn't. Linguistically, the large part in between portrays her as naive, that she didn't go on a date with Harry because of his status and also as someone who looks at other people's inner qualities, in this case, Harry's kindness. This large part sounds pre-planned, something that Megan wanted to say before the interview, and that she just waited for the right moment. Pre-planned agendas are constantly seen in political interviews and debates. These agendas have a self-serving function. Next, Megan selects Harry through gaze and intonation, Harry parrots her words meet again, showing that he's willing to cooperate the way Megan wants him to. We went and um, had a met for a drink, and then I think very quickly into that we said, well, "What are we doing tomorrow? We should yeah. we should meet again." What are we doing tomorrow? Let's meet again. And then it was like, right, diaries. We need to get the diaries out and find out how we're going to make this work because I was off to Africa for a month. Mm. Um, she was working, and we just said, "Right, where's where's the gap?" And the gap happened to be in the perfect place. Um, so. In the following, Harry's asked a question about Meghan. So how much did you, Prince Harry, know about Meghan? Had you seen her on TV? No, I'd, I'd never, <laughs> never even heard about her until this friend said Meghan Markle. I was like, right, okay, give me, give me a bit of background, <laughs> what, what's, like what's going on here? So no, I'd never, I'd, I'd never watched Suits, I'd, I'd never heard of Meghan before, mm -hmm. and I was beautifully surprised when I, when I walked into that room and saw her, and there she was sitting there, I was like, okay, well, I'm going to really have to up, up my game. <laughs> I'm going to sit down and, have a, and make sure I've got a good chat. I think for both of us, though, it was, it was really refreshing because... As Harry's closing his turn on the noun chat, 
Megan self-selects by her turn initial breath in. I think and make sure I've got a good chat. She does this before the turn goes back to the interviewer. So obviously, it's sensitive to her to make this about her as well. I think for both of us, though. As she says, the word though marks a slight contrast with a modifying function. Given that I didn't know a lot about him, everything that I've learned about him, I learned through him, as opposed to having grown up around different news stories or tabloids or whatever else. Anything I learned about him and his family was what he would share with me and vice versa. So for both of us, it was just a really authentic and organic way to get to know each other. In the dependent clause, given that I didn't know a lot about him, we note a lot. A lot doesn't exclude that she did know something about him. However, she then performs a so-called strengthening by saying that everything she learned about him, she learned through him. Everything that I've learned about him, I learned through him, as opposed to having grown up around. Everything excludes that she knew about him before. So once more, we learn that it's sensitive to her to emphasize her alleged lack of knowledge. She repeats the phrase for the both of us. For both of us, it was just a really... This phrase has two functions. One, to indicate that a turn's about to end, given this repetition. Utterances frequently end the way they started. And two, to include both of them, even though the interviewer only asked Harry. But in, in the case of your relationship, unlike for most people, there's this whole layer of what it means to get involved with someone from the royal family. Mm -hmm. How much of a sense did you have Megan, of the enormity of what you were getting into, what it might mean for your life. I think I can very safely say, as naive as it sounds now, mm. having gone through this learning curve in the past year and a half, I did not have any understanding of just what it would be like. I don't think either of us did that. We both said that, even though we knew yeah, that I, it would be. Yeah, I tried to. I tried. I tried to warn. I tried to warn you as much as possible. Mm. But I think both of us were in, totally surprised by the the reaction after the first five, six months of when we had to ourselves of what actually happened from then. So I think you can, you can have as many conversations as you want and try and prepare as much as possible, but we were, we were totally un unprepared for, for what happened after that. The scrutiny. Well, all sorts. <laughs> Again, Megan inserts a clause that marks a difference between now and then. As naive as it sounds now. Mm. The sentence presupposes that she's no longer naive, that she's now gone through a learning curve having gone through this learning curve in the past year and a half. Having gone indicates a completed process, not an ongoing one. With the associating linguistic element. I don't think either of us did that. We both said that. She then selects Harry to speak. He's now given the right to answer the question that the interviewer originally asked Megan. Megan obviously wants to share this question. This way of sharing shows the interviewer and the viewers that she and Harry are in agreement about the answer that she started. This type of alignment or association is highly important to her. Next, Megan continues to point out that she hasn't led the life of a stereotypical celebrity. However, notice her own reservations in form of the term to that degree and the word relatively. These reservations downplay her experiences while still acknowledging them that she has, in fact, had certain quote-unquote celebrity experiences. No, I mean, I think also because there's a misconception that because I have worked in the entertainment industry that this would be something I would be familiar with. But even though I'd been on my show for, I guess, six years at that point, and working before that, I've never been part of tabloid culture. I've never been in pop culture to that degree and, and lived relatively quiet life, even though I focus so much on my job. And um, so that was a really stark mm. difference out of the gate. But um, and I think we were just hit so hard at the beginning with a lot of mistruths that I made the choice to not read anything positive or negative. It just didn't make sense. And instead, we focused all of our energies just on nurturing our relationship on us. Yeah. On us. Yeah. And In the following, Harry's quick to tone down that he and Meghan represent something new. Instead, he takes the opportunity to praise Megan as a team player. His answer is interesting, considering that only a few years later, the two of them escaped their royal roles, and Harry made criticisms of his family. Also, his descriptions point to a prominent romantic, perhaps even hopeless romantic side of him. 
But now that it is all official, Prince Harry, do you have that sense that the combination of the two of you, your different backgrounds, that you together represent something new for the royal family? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if it's something new. I think it's, um, you know, it's a, for me, it's a, an added member of the family. It's, a, it's, a, it's another, another team player as part of the, the bigger team. And, you know, for all of us, all we want to do is be able to carry out um, the right engagements, carry out mm -hmm. our work and try and encourage others and the younger generation to be able to see the, the world in the, in the correct sense rather than um, perhaps being dis having a, a distorted view. So, you know, the fact, that I, the fact that I fell in love with Meghan so incredibly quickly was a, was a sort of confirmation to me that, that everything, everything, all the stars were aligned, everything was just perfect. It was this beautiful woman just sort of literally tripped and fell into my life, I <laughs> fell into her life. And the fact that she, I, I know the fact that she'll be really unbelievably good at the job part of it as well, um, is obviously a huge, huge relief to me because she'll be able to deal with, with everything else that comes with it. But um, mm -hmm. no, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're a fantastic team, we know we are, and, and we'll, we, we hope to, you know, over time, try and have as much impact for all the things that we care about as, as much as possible. I am very excited about that, yeah. As was the case for Meghan, Harry says it contains much more information than the question called for. Again, it sounds pre-planned, or at least highly deliberate. To emphasize that they're a team fighting for different causes. With I am very excited about that, yeah. Megan again lets her thoughts be known before the turn is handed back to the interviewer. Here, her closing insertion shows that she's in agreement with Harry. <laughs> and it's an immense change. You're, you're getting a new country out of it, mm -hmm. um, a, a husband, obviously, but also oh. giving up, giving, <laughs> giving up <laughs> your nice. career. Yes, that's nice. Yes. But I, I don't see it as giving anything up. I just see it as a it's change. A, it's, a new, it's a new challenge. It's a new, it's a new chapter, yeah. right? And, and also keep in mind, I, I've been working on my show for seven years. Um, so we are very, very fortunate to be able to have that sort of longevity on a series. And for me, once we hit the 100 episode marker, I thought, you know what? I have, I have ticked this box and I feel really proud of the work I've done there. And now it's time to, as you said, work, work as a team with, with you. Yeah. Just like Harry said he didn't see their relationship as something new, Meghan says that she doesn't see her new life as giving anything up. This is in contrast to her statements in the Oprah interview. Harry reacts to Meghan's micropause by inserting it's a new challenge. I just see it as a it's change. A, it's, a new, it's a new challenge. Meghan then parrots his words it's a new but replaces the noun challenge with chapter. It's a, new, it's a new chapter. Challenge implies an element of struggle and possibly something momentary, whereas chapter implies something steadier and potentially lasting. I'll argue that the interviewer's words giving up your career trigger Megan. Megan says, right. right has an inbuilt preference for agreement and it's used to check for agreement. The adverb also signals additional information and is used as a preface to the imperative keep in mind. And, and also keep in mind, I, I've been working on my show for seven years. This is assertive language with a commanding tone that presupposes that the interviewer hasn't or probably hasn't kept this in mind before she phrased the question like this. Additionally, it's sensitive to Megan to emphasize the success of the show, thus praising her career choices. So the words giving up your career seem to make a take a defensive stance. Self-praise is often part of a person's defense. It often surfaces when the person feels intimidated in some way. As a closing, she again associates with Harry, parroting his word team, thus showing the interviewer and the viewers that the two of them are in alignment. Work as a team mm. with, with mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. yeah. In the following, Notice Harry's interjections, self-repairs, and uses of you know. These are all markers of hesitation and very likely discomfort. But he then returns to the word team and returns to praising Megan for being capable of anything. If he's having trouble answering, he goes to these fixed points. Fixed points are often seen in political interviews and debates as well. But do you have that sense of responsibility, Prince Harry, for what, you've, for what you're asking Meghan to do? 
Of course, um, that sense of responsibility was was essentially from day one, or maybe a couple of months in, when I suddenly realised actually this is, you know, I've, I've, I feel I know that I'm in love with this girl, and I hope that she's in love with me. But we still had to sit down on the sofa, and I still, you know, I still had to have some pretty, you know, frank conversations with her to say, look, you know, what you're letting yourself in for is, mm. it is, it's, it's a big, it's a big deal, and it's, um, you know, it's not, I wouldn't. It's not. It's not easy for anybody. Um, but I know that, you know, at the end of the day, she she chooses me, and I choose her. Um, and therefore, you know, whatever whatever we have to tackle together or individually will always be us together as a team. So, I think I think she's capable. It's so of, nicely said, isn't it? You know, I don't know. But she's capable of she's capable of anything. Um, and together, as I said, there's there's a lot of stuff and work that needs doing. Um, at the moment, for us, it's going to be making sure that our relationship is always put first. But um, no, look, both of us have passions for, 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 for wanting to make change, change for good. And, uh, you know, with lots of young people running around the Commonwealth, that's where we're going to spend most of our time. With. Harry's now completed his term and the interviewer is given the right to ask the next question. However, Megan self-selects to be the next speaker. She starts with the conjunction and, adding on to Harry's statement, and again, showing how much the two of them are in alignment, supposedly. And it was really one of the first things we connected on. It was one of the yeah. first things we started talking about when we met was just the different things that we wanted to do in the world and how passionate we were about seeing change. I think that was, um, mm. that's what got date two <laughs> in the books, probably. Plenty to talk about. In the following, the interviewer asked both of them if they've met each other's families. Megan immediately takes the turn to speak about Harry's family, that is. This is a way of controlling the direction of the conversation. Have you you've met each other's families, I imagine? Yes, his family's been so welcoming and, and... You've met quite a few of them, actually. I have, on both sides of his family, his mom's yeah. side as well, which has been really important to me too. But um, yes, the family has been great and over the past year and a half, we've just had a really nice time getting to know them and progressively helping me feel a part of, of not just the mm. institution, but also part of the family, which has been really, um, really special. Trying to track them down and make sure that they're around at the same time that she's popping in without telling too many people. And uh, <laughs> so we've managed, we've actually done incredibly well um, to make sure that you've met all the, all the key people. In the next excerpt, we should pay close attention to Megan's sudden mood change and Harry's discomfort as a result of it. So does that mean a lot of the time that you've been together in this last year and a half, you've been you've been at home a lot? Yes. yes. No, we've we've, uh, well, yeah, we had to re sort of reverse the whole process and cosy nights in in front of the television, cooking dinner with um, you know, just the two of us by ourselves in our mm. little cottage, um, rather than going out for dinner and being seen in public. So we we have we reversed the whole process, which is, it's 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 provided different opportunities mm. and it's made us. A a lot closer in a shorter space of time. That's I can, true. That's you know without question. So, you know, if anybody else at home is listening, then maybe you know slow down on the dates and maybe spend more time at home. But um, no, it's it's for us. It's it's an opportunity to to really get to know each other without other people you know looking or trying to take photos on their phones and all that kind of stuff. You know, with that that comes that comes comes with the comes with the job comes with the role. But um, well, where so possible, yeah. yeah. And we were able to really get to know each other that way. Yeah. But also then to go and have friends over for dinner or to yeah. go to his family for tea or. Yeah. Megan's visibly displeased with Harry's statement that he's enjoyed not having people take photos on their phones. That comes that comes comes with the comes with the job comes with the role. But um, well, where so possible, yeah. Harry's multiple self repairs reveal his internal stress before he's able to say that it comes with the role and then minimizes his previous statement with the words, but where possible. This internal stress seems to be influenced by Megan's firm gaze. Harry hesitates with the interjection, uh, before he completes his turn grammatically with said minimization and he looks at Megan for approval. Even though his sentence not grammatically completed, Megan makes an overlap right after Harry's hesitation marker letting him know that she wants the next turn. Comes with the job, comes with the role, but um, well, where possible. Obviously, it's sensitive to her to jump in and change the direction of Harry's answer. When Harry completes the sentence, Megan says, yeah. In this context, yeah doesn't have an acknowledging function. It's short and immediately followed by her own modifications. 
Yes. Yeah. And we were able to really get to know each other that way, mm. but also then to go and have friends over for dinner or to mm. go to his family for tea or... Yeah. This kind of, yeah, is a way for Meghan to cut Harry off and secure the next turn, either before Harry continues or the turn returns to the interviewer. These were some examples of how turn takings used to establish power dynamics and used to modify another speaker's statements. I hope you found it useful. If you like these types of videos and want more of them, please subscribe to the channel. See you in the next video.